This spring at the Sultan Library, two young people overdosed on synthetic marijuana known as spice. And if you don't know about spice, you will know about it before you leave tonight. It's a drug that, while not illegal, can cause seizures, hallucinations, and vomiting. But the drug problem along the corridor goes much farther than spice. The Snohomish County Tribune reports that the number of substance abuse calls and thefts in the first six months of 2014 was seven to eight times higher than the same period a year ago. Police say that most of the thefts were committed to fuel a heroin habit and all of the substance abuse calls thus far have been related to heroin. High school girls are reportedly using heroin as a weight loss product. Heroin is showing up in, in routine traffic stops. Drug-related hospital admissions have skyrocketed. Heroin and other drugs are taking a toll on the health and the security of the community. Lives are being cut short. Families are shattered, and that is why we are here tonight to talk about that, to understand the extent of the drug problem, <clears throat> and to share some ideas for addressing the problems. After opening comments from each of our four panelists tonight, we'll take questions, uh, we'll ask questions, we'll open the floor up to questions, and we will try and find some answers tonight as well. When the time comes for those questions, we have a roving microphone. We'll bring that microphone to you. We will hold it for you to, uh, to ask your question. Please address your question to someone in particular. You can certainly address the question to all four of them. Don't address your question to me. I don't know anything. For those of us who are joining us by Twitter, please tweet your questions. You'll have, we'll have them asked for you at the appropriate <coughs> time. Tonight on our panel, we have Detective David Chitwood of the Snohomish Regional Drug and Gang Task Force, Bart Wheaton, Chemical Dependency Counselor with Catholic Community Services and Cocoon House, Carrie Boone, Vice Chair of the Monroe Community Coalition, and we're we have Officer Scott Cornish from the Monroe Police Department with us as well. So for the opening part of our forum tonight, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to just make a brief statement, talk briefly from their experiences of what they've seen, what they know, and, and, and their thoughts about drugs and drug use along the US-2 corridor. And uh, I think we'll just begin with Officer Scott Cornish. <clears throat> Thank you, Ed. Thank you for having me here tonight. Thanks for everybody just showing up. <clears throat> I'm Officer Scott Cornish. I work for the Monroe Police Department. I've been in law enforcement 10 years. Uh, during the time with Monroe, um, I have training in uh, gang customs and suppression. Uh, I'm a hostage negotiator. Um, I was a school resource officer, which I left in January of 2013 to become in my position now on the Monroe Police Proact team. Uh, officer Springer, who is also here today to speak. Uh, took my position at the as the school resource officer in January 2013. Uh, the PROACT team in Monroe, we have three members, myself, my partner who could not be here today, who is a narcotics canine handler, and a sergeant. We with the PROACT team, um, we don't get dispatched to calls. We do proactive enforcement, uh, directed patrol, we work problem houses with surveillance, uh, plainclothes enforcement, uh, and surveillance, and uniform uh, patrol. <clears throat> Mostly with narcotics, but also with narcotics is what Ed had mentioned, <clears throat> comes a lot of property crimes. So we work organized retail theft, uh, vehicle prowls, burglaries, and uh, EBT and welfare fraud, which is commonly, all of those things are commonly associated with narcotics. Uh, Organized retail theft, and I think Detective Chitwood could say this from his area in Snohomish as well, is gone off the charts with Lowe's, Home Depot, uh, even Albertson's Safeway, Fred Meyer, uh, Kohl's, uh, and it's usually to finance a drug habit. And the same with EBT fraud. We're finding um, EBT welfare cards are being traded for narcotics. Thank you. Cool, thanks. 
Uh, I am Detective Chitwood. I work for the uh, Snohomish Regional Drug and Gang Task Force. Uh, I am a deputy and I'm assigned to the Drug Task Force. I've been in law enforcement for 22 years. I came from the city of Lake Forest Park and transferred over to Snohomish County Sheriff's Office back in 99. Um, I kind of found my niche into the drug world when I started doing patrol and stuff. That sounds kind of weird, but it was what I like to do and what interests me and what I'd like to enforce. So uh, eventually got hired with the Drug Task Force. So currently now at the Drug Task Force, I, I do all kinds of stuff actually. I handle all the tips that come in. I uh, work the website that we have. Uh, I have, we just started a Facebook page. Any drug trainings, drug talks, community events or something, I'm kind of like the face of the task force to be able to go out and do those types of things. And then I do street level drug enforcement and drug uh, nuisance houses. I work with patrol on those to shut down the activity there. Uh, what, what our task force does in Sonoma uh, County, it's a regional drug task force, so it's multi-jurisdictional. It just doesn't you know, help unincorporated Sonoma County. Uh, we work with Monroe and Bothell and uh, Stanwood, Granite Falls. Um, so what we do is obviously the detectives there are undercover and they work mid to upper level enforcement. So they're trying to stop the supply of the narcotics, the drugs coming into Snohomish County and that's what they do. Um, where mine is like Officer Cornish is doing is the more lower end street level uh, addiction uh, problem retail theft type enforcement and stuff. So um, again, at the Drug Task Force, it's kind of like a one-stop shop. It's really nice to have in Snohomish County. We have uh, officers from other jurisdictions, obviously, and then we have some federal officers in our department, and then we have the health department, we have CPS. Uh, and the reason we have health department and CPS there is for when we go to these places that are problem areas and they have a sewage issue, a garbage issue, uh, if there's a house that has kids, we have somebody assigned to our office that's able to help with that problem right then and there. Um, we also have a prosecutor that's assigned to our office. So any of the cases that I write, <clears throat> they don't go up to Snohomish County and get four or five different cases going with four or five different prosecutors. We have one prosecutor that takes our cases and does our criminal prosecution, so it's really cool. Uh, we also have a, a detective in there that does all of our civil seizure type stuff, so when we take somebody's car, see somebody's house, take their money from drug funds, or that type of thing, we're able to do that. So yeah, it's, a, it's unfortunate that we have to have such a big task force uh, in Snohomish County, but knowing that we have it is great because you know we have the ability to do a lot of different stuff. So um, yeah, as you know, criminals don't have any boundaries. So being able to work with Skagit County, King County, Thurston County, Whatcom County, um, all of our detectives do a great job there. So, and you guys are lucky to have a proact team and such a you know a good police department in Monroe that's very proactive and looking after the community and stuff too. So uh, you guys are lucky to have that. So. Um, I think that's it for me. All right, David, thank you. Uh, Bart Wheaton. Hi, uh, my name is Bart Wheaton. I'm a substance abuse counselor, uh, chemical dependency counselor for Catholic Community Services. I uh, also work f um, through Cocoon House that um, for the at-risk youth, um, higher at-risk youth right now. And I've um, been doing this for f about five years now, um, working for Catholic Community Services. I, uh, I guess um, one of the things that um, was brought up at the last panel, I don't know if any of you were at the Snohomish panel, um, was one of the things that I think was a kind of a, uh, I don't know, a, a faulty kind of idea that there's a good drug and a bad drug. And um, I'd like to just talk a little bit about that. Um, how I address the, the teenagers or the adolescents that I work with is I try not to put that category, you know, categorize those drugs as, as a bad or a good drug um, because all of those substances, whether it be marijuana, um, heroin, uh, alcohol, uh, amphetamines, all those substances, um, they, can't, they can be used as prescribed and, and, you know, recreationally, some of them. So I don't try to um, say that, that people, uh, you know, those drugs are bad. If I come out of an adolescent that the, those drugs are bad, the, what will happen is, is the adolescent who, who is taking those drugs will tell me I'm crazy. <laughs> because a lot of times those drugs really work for, the, for those um, teenagers I work with. They like the effect produced by those drugs. It's like me telling you, 
oxygen's bad for you, you'd say I was crazy. So I don't try to, I try to meet them where they're at, um, so to speak. And, and I think that any drug can be bad if it's used to ab abused and to the point of addiction. So I try to address the addiction as, as a disease rather than try to, to say that there's one drug that's worse than the other drug. Um, that's a kind of a slippery slope I don't try to get into. I mean, there's certainly worse symptoms of withdrawal for different drugs or worse, um, a, a more addictive um, way that the drugs affect your mind and, and those things, there's a lot of different, um, different things that, that, that those drugs do, but I don't try to separate them. I don't try to um, uh, let the kids know that, you know, becoming, I've seen, I, I tour around the detox centers in the area, you know, and volunteer, and I see kids in there that are detoxing from heroin, methamphetamines, and it's inevitable. I ask them what's the first drug they ever took, and inevitably it's almost always marijuana, the first illicit drug that they've ever um, used. So it's, you know, any one of them can be bad. Thanks. Thank you. Carrie. I'm Carrie Boone. Can you hear me okay? Um, and I am representing the Monroe Community Coalition. Uh, I, we're, we're coming kind of more from a prevention and wellness standpoint. Um, and our, uh, the Monroe Community Coalition is a grassroots coalition made up of um, people from various sectors here in Monroe. We have representation from the police force, from the school district, um, from the faith community, parents, and some from the library, and anyone is welcome to participate. And we are trying together to accomplish something that we, no one individual or organization can do, and that is to um, help prevent drug use in our community. We are fortunate to be part of a statewide program and the Community Prevention and Wellness Initiative. So we have funding from the state and Monroe was chosen um, based on uh, I, some, some of the elements of our community that show that we have a higher risk for underage drinking and drug abuse, but also because our community has demonstrated the ability to work together and we have very limited resources here in Monroe. So. It's really exciting to me that we have this resource available in our community. We've just been getting started and are starting to try to get to the root causes of drug use in our community. So we're working on strengthening the prevention programs that we have even down to the preschool level, elementary school, middle school, and high school. And um, we have, through the coalition, of, um, it supports a full-time uh, drug prevention counselor at the middle school and then the district also has a counselor at the high school so um, some of the things that we've been doing in the community we have a campaign you may have seen at the movie theater called talk we talk we, they hear you encouraging parents to talk with their kids about um, about drugs and alcohol one of the things that we've noticed in looking at data um, as we've been trying to Get, get a better picture of what the needs and issues are um, with drug and alcohol use in, in especially youth, is that the perception is very distorted. You can ask, uh, in the Healthy Youth Survey, kids were asked how many of their peers did they think um, use alcohol? And um, the kids responded that 64% um, is, is what their perception is, when in reality, uh, it's 24%. So um, their perception of, of if there will be consequences with law enforcement, most of them did not think so. Um, their perception of, of parents caring or, or showing um, of supporting, um, most kids didn't think it was an issue with parents and, and had didn't think that their parents were concerned about that. So there are a lot of perception issues that we feel like we can make a difference and we're excited about um, having this coalition in our community and everyone is welcome to participate. 
Thank you. Um, I'll start off with some, <coughs> some questions here just to set some background and, and, and some parameters here. And, I, and I'll ask Bart this question, and then I'll also put the question to Officer uh, Cornish and Detective Chitwood. When you say youth in these detox centers, what, what age range are you dealing with? And are you seeing the age group getting lower as the years progress, or are you, have you maintained uh, a fairly stable uh, age range of, of youth that you're dealing with in these detox centers? And then similar question for the detective and the officer, the youth that they're dealing with, are they getting younger? So uh, I think that the age that I usually um, uh, am doing assessments on kids it's been about the same. It's usually in the age between seventh and eighth grade is when you'll see a lot of them will start and I'll first start to see them. And uh, in the detox centers, I would say, yeah, I've seen a younger crowd show up there. And since I've, I've, I've only been doing this for five years, but definitely because of um, the prevalence of, of heroin and, and um, amphetamines in our, in our communities, because that's a, you need medical help to detox off those, um, or at least the heroin. And, and uh, detective, have, have you, in the, your 20 years, have you seen the age range dropping? That's a, that's a hard one for me to answer, because coming from Lake Forest Park, I didn't see that. It was mainly the 19 to 29 year olds that we were, I mean, we had two elementary schools in the city of Lake Forest Park. Coming into the county, working with the county, obviously we saw the wide range from elementary school up. So I would say it's, we've seen maybe younger kids a little bit earlier now, but I'm not, I'm not thinking and looking at going, oh my gosh, we're seeing fifth graders and sixth graders doing this type of stuff. Uh, more so now than we did before. Um, but I, I am seeing more homeless teenagers on the street that are addicted to drugs and stuff now than I ever have before. So maybe that's a little bit of a yes as far as the younger kids. Officer Cornish? Uh, I mostly work uh, with the same age group as on the street as most people are 21 and over that I deal with. I mean, up into their 60s, people have been doing drugs for so long. I talk to all of the people that I either contact for narcotics or arrest. And when I worked patrol, um, you know, the last eight, year, eight years previous to going to the school. Uh, and a lot of these kids would tell me, or adults now would tell me, that they started using when they were 13. I talked to many girls like that were using methamphetamine at 13 years old is when they first tried it. Um, and again, with the juvenile teenage uh, street kids uh, that, that are on the street um, tend to be using as well. I think Officer Springer working at the high school might have a better uh, current answer with the juveniles, with the youth. Well, let's give uh, Officer Springer the microphone. Officer Springer, just introduce yourself, please, and then just go ahead and answer the question. You bet. Officer Justin Springer, Monroe Police Department. I'm currently assigned as a school resource officer at Monroe High School. And I, prior to coming to the, I'll go ahead and stand up. Prior to going to the high school, of course, I worked patrol at the street level with everything and and currently you know my age group that i work with is eighth grade through seniors and unlike these guys i'm not working with 21 year old crowd and up and the, the biggest issue i see at the high school are prescription drugs and marijuana those are the two biggest i have not made a personal arrest for heroin at the high school but i know kids are using it who are there so it probably helps yes, give a little yes, background and through the course of the evening, if uh, you want to join in, just throw something at me, and we'll bring the microphone over to you. So okay. if I ask a question and you want to reply, just throw something at me, and I'll see that you get the microphone. Uh, Carrie, age group that you're dealing with, uh, it, what, what's the age range for, the, the, for your organization? Uh, preschool up through high school, and then and just generally in our community. And on a personal level, I'm a mom in this community, so I have kids at the high school and middle school, and I hear um, all kinds of things that they see at, at the high school and middle, middle school level at the parks. My sixth grader last year saw kids, just a lot of activity and um, 
Fuca pens and some of the newer things that I didn't see when I was a kid. Um, seems to be my five-year-old brought me a marijuana pipe at the beach this week. A little treasure she'd found on the on the beach. So <laughs> it's affecting all of my kids. <laughs> well, let me follow up with a, with a, something that uh, Bart Wheaton brought up. And, and just to ask each of you, uh, and, and, and Bart, you can expand a little bit on your answer. At, at the risk of, of uh, offending some, but based on, on, on anecdotal experiences that you've all got, uh, is marijuana the starting point for drug use? Do you find marijuana swirling around mm -hmm. in the early stages of the people that you deal with, the people that, that you talk with, when they are involved with, with the higher drugs, the, the amphetamines and the heroin and things of that nature? We'll, we'll yeah, and when I was at the school, um, <clears throat> especially I had a debate with a young student before the legalization of marijuana for adults. Um, about smoking marijuana. Uh, and remember to the THC content, which is what gets you high, in today's marijuana is a lot different than it was in the 70s and 80s. Um, you know, I've got the Williton herb. Well, growing on the shoulder of a road, natural growth with a 1% THC level, maybe. It's like catnip. But some of this marijuana is at 30% THC. They're making butter with it, which they're um, using butane and sucking out the THC concentration, which is off the charts for the, for the content of THC. And, and what I had discussed with this young man was about being a gateway drug. And I said, well, look, I said, every person I've ever contacted or arrested or spoke with about heroin or methamphetamine use all started smoking marijuana. So I asked him if he still thought it was a gateway drug. Not everyone that smokes marijuana will shoot heroin. But everyone who shoots heroin started out smoking marijuana, for the most part. Detective? Yeah, I think it could be considered a gateway drug. Uh, alcohol could be at the kid's level. Um, just the idea of what they're using, like the hookah pipe, that could be the gateway drug now to, you know, what's out there. I mean, we're seeing hookah pipes all over. For those of you who don't know what a hookah pipe is, it's like an e-cigarette. You put... Uh, you know, some type of a cartridge in it that has liquid and it vaporizes it and you inhale that, that vapor that comes out of there. And it's supposed to be safer and smokeless and all this stuff, you know, so that you don't get the secondhand smoke and stuff. But, um, you know, that could, that could be something that starts up. So I, I, I'm not one to say, yes, marijuana is the gateway drug and that's the one that, you know, everybody's been doing. I think it could be, but it could also be alcohol. It could be something else in the house too, so. Okay, Carrie, uh, what has been your experience? I would just add prescription drugs to the list of Gateway, but I also, um, in the hearings we participated in for retail sale of marijuana here in Monroe, and uh, several people who had personal experience with marijuana shared kind of their testimonials of, um, and, and that was the consensus that, you know, one uh, a pastor here in our community shared that he and um, some of his buddies had started out in high school using marijuana kind of experimenting and all of them committed that oh yeah this will never lead to anything and he just shared the tragedies that um, as they escalated to higher drugs that almost all of them had gotten into serious drug issues one of them had died and um, he just felt really strongly against the use of marijuana because of his experience. And one other um, man that shared his experience uh, shared that his son um, had been introduced to marijuana by a friend's mother and that had, he had spent the last five years in rehabilitation programs and, and upwards of $200,000 between them and their insurance in trying to help him get clean. And Bart, anything you want to add to, to what uh, you, you started the discussion? Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate that I don't think any one drug is any worse than any. If you're addicted to a drug, that's the problem. The problem is the addiction. It's not really the drug, albeit m marijuana is a gateway, I believe. I mean, I've worked with youth, like I said, for the last five years, and without fail, the initial drug that they've almost always used is marijuana. But they've 
can be the and I see kids make the ultimate sacrifice of their freedom. They're on probation, knowing that if they smoke marijuana, that they will go to jail. They do it anyways. So um, that's a pretty big sacrifice. Sacrifice your freedom to smoke that drug. So that tells you the impact that marijuana can have on a person's brain when they're addicted. I mean, and I've seen a lot of things happen as far as even in adults, um, they'll you know flunk a drug test and and lose their job and, and it'll affect their family immensely. So uh, it's, I mean, either way, addiction to any drug. I mean, I've seen people get addicted to video games and, and that caused a huge problem in their, in their lives and, and in their families. So I try not to concentrate or beat down on any one drug because I know people that can recreationally smoke marijuana. I know people that also use it medicinally. I saw him, you know, there's people that can do that. If, if I could just add one of the things, I guess, that is concerning to me about um, marijuana in particular is that because it is legal, um, that has a very significant impact on the perception of kids. When, when we as adults have voted to make marijuana the drug legal, then um, <coughs> kids with developing brains and teenagers who have not yet fully developed the ability to see through the consequences of their choices are seeing that adults have, have made that choice, then it's really especially important to make it clear to kids that just because marijuana is legal does not mean that it is safe for them. You've been looking ahead at my notes, haven't you? <laughs> We're going to open it up to questions in the audience here in a few moments. Uh, so if you do have uh, some questions, and I'm sure you do, begin to formulate those questions and, and who you might want to ask them to. But you, you've given me the opportunity to, to lead into a very broad question, which is how does the dynamic change now? What do you as the panelists think the situation is going to be now that marijuana use is legal for adults? Uh, do you fear, anticipate that drug use is going to go up if a parent can come home from work, light up and relax with a pipe just the same as a parent comes home and opens a beer or begins with a cocktail in the evening? Your, your thoughts on how that dynamic is going to change. Officer Cornish? Um, I think that we we probably will see uh, an increase of marijuana use um, with the youth, um, and we'll see. Officer Springer, I don't know if you've had any. Actually, yeah. hold on just a second. Let's bring the mic. You didn't throw anything at me. <laughs> I, I started uh, the school resource officer position at a unique time because I started, I believe, it was the week or the second week after marijuana was legalized for those 21 and up. And I was working with Officer Cornish, and that first week I believe it was six students I had arrested for possession of marijuana at the school. And at the end of the week I looked at them and I said, is this the norm? You know, I, I was amazed by it. And he said no, but it, there was a definite spike at that time. And I still make several arrests on a regular basis at the high school for marijuana, and that's probably the number one arrest, like I said, in, prescription drugs right there with it. So, so yeah, I, I've seen it. Can, uh, you, can you draw a comparison with before the legalization of marijuana? Was there fewer? What was the what do, arrests prior to the legalization? Well, I don't have any experience before because I just started at the high school the week after, so. I did, but the first week that he was there was a busy week. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I don't think we've seen that yet. I don't know that we know the impact of what that's going to be yet. Kids going home to families, to older siblings that are smoking marijuana because it's legal and they bought it at, legally at a place that they're smoking. So I don't know that we've seen the impact of that. But I think as parents, as grandparents, as guardians, as law enforcement and, and others, we have to be able to educate the kids earlier and, and have conversations and talk and say, you know, like something I'd say to my kid is, listen, if you go to a friend's house and now that marijuana is legal and their parents light up or their uncle lights up or they're smoking marijuana or something, I want you to call me. I'll come and get you. 
and you're not going to be allowed to go there because I choose in my family not to smoke it. So I'm going to teach my kids that it's dangerous. And when you turn 21, if that's what you choose to decide to do, just like alcohol, that's what you choose to do at 21. So I think we just have to be able to, con you know, have conversations with the kids and let them know what we like or, you know, what we want them to do. It's just like if you go to a friend's house and their parents are drinking and they want to drive down and get a red box movie, I don't want you to get in the car with them. We've had those conversations and that's what we have to do as adults. Gary, before I ask you what you say to your kids, I want to ask Detective Chitwood that conversation. If you're at a friend's house and uh, mom or dad decides to light up, call me, I'm going to come get you. Do you have that same conversation if they're at a friend's house and mom and dad wants to open a beer or pour a cocktail? Do you tell them, call me and come and get me? No, I don't have that conversation with them. Why not? What's the difference? I mean, I think the only conversation I had is if they're drinking, um, which one of their friends is, that when they go to that house is you don't get in a car with them if they're drinking. Um, you know, but I didn't have a conversation with them as, hey, if they're having a beer, you know. Um, I just think secondhand smoke and what happens when you're, when you're smoking marijuana is more of a concern to me if the parents come home and have a glass of wine or a, a thing of beer. Um, and I can add a little bit to that too. I, you know, I think my, my perception is the same way as, is if somebody's parents is having a glass of wine and their adults are legal to do so, it's not affecting the child. If somebody's sitting there smoking marijuana near someone, you can smell marijuana a block away. It smells like somebody ran over a skunk. Uh, in fact, I think the first day that, uh, a couple a month ago or so, uh, I think the first stores were opening up, I was actually going home to Snohomish. I had the window down. I went, wow, somebody hit a skunk? I came into downtown on uh, First Street where the bars are, and I, all I smelled was marijuana smoke. So I think that it will, you know, no one's supposed to smoke in public because it does affect other people, but I think you're going to see some, some of that. And, it, you know, it affected me driving down the road. I mean, just the, the fact that you could smell it so strongly. Gary, your conversation <clears throat> with your kids if, about marijuana, about alcohol? Um, we start really young with what are the good things that we put into our body and what things are not good. Um, try to give them as much information about the harm that it does to our body. And I guess for our family, we've chosen um, to uh, not use any of those substances. So we encourage our kids. Um, I guess we just talk about the harmful effects. Um, the, the campaign that I was raised on was just say no and kind of more of the scare tactics and research has shown that, that those don't work, but, but giving kids some reasons. Um, some of the, the drugs like, um, I forgot the name of it. Um, Molly ecstasy? Yes, and some of the synthetic things that they're creating. Spice. Like spice. spice, thank you. Um, Again, you're looking at my notes. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know what's in those, and they can deform and harm our bodies in ways we have no idea. And if kids have some understanding of, it's not just say no, but it's just say no because this is what can happen. You can be permanently deformed or completely unable to be independent for the rest of your life when you put these substances into your body. You lose control, you have no judgment, and it can be permanently damaging, so. Mark? Yeah, I agree. Awareness, you know, talk about addiction talk about how addiction is developed and, and talk about how drugs and alcohol affect your mind. Um, that's what, in my family, that's what, what, what I do. You know, I talk about the harms of, of um, how negatively they can, you know, affect you. And I know uh, for my daughter, she has uh, never experiment hasn't experienced, she's a 17, and she came home, I was just about, two, three months ago, and a lot of her friends had just started experimenting. And she was appalled because she hadn't tried it before, and she was wondering why they, they had started experimenting, and she didn't understand it. Because she was raised, like, our, in our house, we, we don't use those substances either. We choose not to. And, and so she doesn't understand that how 
a kid would even want to experiment with those drugs just because of the way she was brought up and, and exposed to, you know, the fears of addiction. She knew about those at an early age. You know, she doesn't want to, that's not a road she wants to go down. And there's, there's huge protective factors that you can use, you know, for youth. I mean, and I, you know, a lot of them are, you know, just involvement in our, in our community, you know, as far as, um, sports and, and youth groups and, and volunteering and there's just huge protective factors that you can use. Oh dad, that's so lame. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you start them at an early age, they then, you know what, this, this, is, this is just a part of their life. That's what my, with my daughter anyways. <clears throat> if anyone has any questions, we'll open it up. So please feel free to raise your hand and uh, we'll bring a microphone to you and get those questions. And while we're going over for that first question, I just want to ask you, Bart, do you always use the phrase when talking with your your daughter or with others, drugs and alcohol are bad? Do you, do you always no, link ab them? Absolutely not. I, I'll just simply ask her to see the kids that she knows that use drugs and alcohol. I'll say, look at those kids. And they, they, do the, they do the explaining for me. I don't have to. I just look at the kids that do use drugs and alcohol chronically, and that that will uh, scare you enough. <laughs> Thank you. Question. Um, yes, this is for Detective Chitwood. Um, where do you feel the breakdown is in keeping the drug-related crime and the trafficking rate down? Could you ask that again? Where do I think the what is? The uh, breakdown of? Um, in keeping the drug-related crime and uh, the trafficking rate down. Well, the trafficking, I mean, it's a multi-trillion dollar business. And we've got Highway 2, we've got 522, we've got the railway, we've got the waterway, we've got the airway, we've got I-5, unfortunately. So we are kind of like a hub for an area for trafficking. Our population is huge in our area. So I don't, I, that's a big question. I don't know where the breakdown would be. I think all our agencies, like I said back earlier in the week, our agencies in Snohomish County do a great job at being proactive out there and doing enforcement. You can only take people to jail so many times. You gotta have options. You gotta have early education. So I think all of us, we're, we're all older, we're experienced. I think we're a great resource to teach our kids, to keep, teach our grandkids to talk at an early age. So maybe that could be part of the breakdown. Um, you know, but as far as enforcement, we only have we only have what we have to enforce. Especially, I mean, in 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 Monroe, they probably have a staffing issue some days. You know, so that that could be an issue. If they're chasing 911 calls all the time, then when you call in a a problem with somebody that maybe a dealer just showed up to a known drug house or something and took off and they couldn't get there, they could have been handling a crash or a burglary or something, and so they were tied up. Um, so staffing is an issue. Um, budgets are an issue. Um, but I think in Snohomish County, we do a really, really good job, and the officers in Snohomish County from Edmonds up to Stanwood, you know, are really trying to stop that flow. And the Drug Task Force is actively doing that and working with other agencies and stuff. So I don't know to specifically answer that question where the breakdown is, but I hope I helped kind of. I think it's supply and demand, right? You get rid of the demand, you, you, I mean, like he was just saying, educate your youth. There's not as much demand. Yeah, what I mean by you guys being a great resource is we want our kids to learn from us, right? We're experienced. We can tell them what we've seen. We can explain to them, you know, hey, back when maybe you have experience to using it and what happened to you. I got suspended, kicked off the football team, and this is what happened to me. That's a good experience to be able to teach your kids. So we want to be able to teach our kids that, you know, the dangers of that. So I think, again, talking early and, and being involved is, is, a, is a really real good thing. And you guys are a great resource because of your experience of what you've read in the paper, what you've seen family-wise, and to be able to share that honestly with the kids <coughs> is very, very important. Some people don't want to talk to their kids about, oh, I, I, okay, I used cocaine back in the day. Well, maybe sharing that with your kid and explain what happened to you and the dangers and maybe medically issue or what happened job-wise is a good learning experience for your kids. So I think being honest with them is a good, good thing too. Just wanted to throw that in there. Another question. Please stand. Oh, okay. And we'll get a microphone to you. Oh, 
All right, okay. <laughs> it looks sort of ominous there. Um, so uh, I was wondering if any of you could comment, I mean, what percentage of heroin versus meth? I mean, where does the heroin and the meth come from? Is it being made in labs in the woods or is it coming from Mexico? Um, how many 911 calls do you really want um, concerning suspicious looking activity? And do you suspect that the supposed, um, well, I mean, a number of people have commented and seen this um, ring that operates out of the Albertsons parking lot over by the dollar store, the, the people that beg, and you know, you see strange things going in and out of trucks at odd hours, and it, do you suspect that that's involved, or is that kind of its own little operation? Well, I can probably answer some of that. <clears throat> Right now, it seems heroin is very prevalent. Um, heroin, in the mid 2000s, Oxycontin came out. Uh, and at the time, it was kids and just, I mean, suburbia America uh, taking mom's pain pills that she got for whatever operation or a bad car crash or something. Became addicted to that. That was very prevalent in 2006, 2007, 2008. Um, they changed Oxycontin after legislation where it couldn't be smoked anymore because that's what they're doing. They were smoking it. Uh, it was extremely expensive. On the street, it was a dollar a milligram. Uh, kids were doing, and these started out in high school, kids were doing $80 a day or more, seven days a week. Uh, from that, heroin was cheaper. And it's the same thing. Oxycontin is like, like synthetic morphine. So kids started using that. And at first I saw, I'm sure Detective Chitwood did too, is, is smoking it, smoking on aluminum foil. Now, uh, and meth was still prevalent, now I'm seeing that, and before too, some people who did oxy or meth or heroin didn't do meth. It was either, either or. Now almost every arrest I make and every contact I make, they do both. And they went from smoking to using syringes. IV injection. Um, and with Albertsons, you're speaking of the Monroe? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I've made some arrests in that, in that area. And a lot of those, uh, what a lot of those people are doing too, especially a lot of the, the transients who were out with signs. Yeah, a lot of what they're doing is, some of them are, um, have some mental issues. Um, and they're, they're looking for cigarettes and doing some other things. There's probably some narcotics related things with some of these people. They have addictions. Um, so. so heroin's coming from the north, Canada, and it's coming from the south. Methamphetamine, same thing. We don't have any labs back here anymore. Back in 2000, 1999, yeah, we had lots of labs and we were dealing with that stuff. Um, with people manufacturing meth labs and dump sites and stuff. I think year to date we maybe have two dump sites in Snohomish County, which is awesome because back in 2000 I would tell you we had 70 meth labs or something and we've had 40 dump sites. And dump sites are meaning somebody that made meth, put it in a bag or something and threw it on the side of the road or left it in a park and some hikers found it or something. So that stuff's weighed down right now. But it's all coming from out of the state. Okay, and all, most of the states are dealing with what we're dealing with. Um, your other question was about calling and suspicious stuff. Here's what I tell people about that is we encourage people to use 911. And yeah, I don't want to know that there's a raccoon in your backyard, right? Or your neighbor parked their mail or their garbage can too close to your driveway. Okay, yeah, I think that's a waste of 911 call. Okay, but as far as a suspicious person or somebody doing something funny, somebody, a, a vehicle that's in the wrong place, we encourage you to call 911 because Monroe might be looking for that car or they might be looking for that person and that opens up a case that they just were able to make an arrest or put something together. So just by you calling, an officer could be right around the corner right at that time and able to make a contact to be able to talk to that person. If you suspect a house of doing something, I mean, I would check with Monroe and see if they have an anonymous reporting type or something like that online with their website. 
um, you know, they, they like to hear about that stuff, traffic complaints to suspicious drug house. Uh, the Drug Task Force has their website. They have anonymous reporting on there. And if we were to get something in the city of Monroe, we would then forward it to them so that they would know about Because they may not know about it. So that's why I encourage people to use the 911 line. Well, <clears throat> first off, for every Monroe citizen, we appreciate those phone calls. You see something that makes you go, huh, call. Um, because we can't be everywhere, you know, and I travel around from problem location to problem location to problem location. Well, sometimes I leave a problem location and something just happened at the one I just left. Uh, I, in fact, had calls today where I talked, spoke with somebody about what was going on. Like I said, we can't we can't be everywhere. I mean, it's not a big city, but it's big enough that it's you know you can't be at every place, and certain places we don't even know about until later on, until people call and fr are frustrated, and say, "Wow, this is going on." Well, we didn't we didn't know because it's happening at odd hours, or it's not a an area that usually has a lot of problems where it's not patrolled as as often. Um, so calls. You guys have no idea how much power you have to change your own environment by calling us and providing some information. So what constitutes like probable cause for a search? Like what sort of information is most? For a search? You know, concerning like somebody has gone into what we know is a drug house with a backpack and they're carrying, you know, something in a package and they've just gotten off of a bike that isn't the right size for their body or type well, what moves it from suspicious <clears throat> to giving you the opportunity <clears throat> to take an action it helps if you can I mean with that kind of scenario what you just explained would be a, a social contact maybe a Terry stop if the officer knows the person but a lot of these people too and people that you're talking about have warrants for their arrest and especially even if just to, to socially contact them, to let that person know that this officer knows that they were in this area at that particular time, which is great. Monroe officers, I know, are, are very proactive with contacting people. How do you keep vehicle prowls down? If somebody's, again, riding around their bike in the middle of the night, adult male on a BMX bike, contact him. So that's what we do is we contact him. I know you were here in this neighborhood. They're not going to prowl your car because they were just identified in that area. Um, and then when it comes to probable cause, it, it, usually for, for a search anymore, there's an arrest that's made. Do you have other questions? Other, anyone else have a question? Let's go back in the corner there. The, oh, but right there to your, to, your, to your left. Okay. Um, my question um, is why have I not heard a more reference to mental health? Um, this, it's almost coming up on an hour. I did hear one meant to the word mental just a few minutes ago. Um, I don't see how we can talk about drug addiction, addictions uh, without talking about mental health. And I could just specifically ask out of the the volume of arrests or the volume of students at the high school, what percentage are identified as having any emotional or mental health issue? Is that a statistic? And if it isn't, I think it should be. Um, if, they, if there aren't addictive behaviors and, a, and an addictive brain and some type of emotional, um, mental, red flags going up along with maybe smoking or drinking there will be if there's continued likely if there's continued use well, let's, of let's, a drug let's, let's put that to bart and carry you would, your experiences so yeah there's a high uh, amount of co what they call co-occurring disorders um so yeah there's a huge amount of that in in addiction um i'd probably 
if I was, I don't know the exact stats, but if I was to take at least 70 to 80% of the people with addiction issues um, have co-occurring disorders, mental disorders. And especially with the, the youth that I work with, the, the higher at risk homeless youth um, that have been uh, passed around from state agency to state agency, foster home to foster home, a lot of those kids have been physically abused, mentally abused, sexually abused. So a lot of those kids have a, a, a huge trauma. You know, and a lot of adult, actually, a lot, I, I find a lot of adult um, people with addiction issues have huge past trauma issues they've never dealt with, or um, grief and loss, or, you know, there's, yeah, it's, it's almost, almost always side by side. And so, yeah, and the, uh, she was talking about the people who hang out, the transients that hang out at the uh, Albertsons, and, and so that is a good question you can bring up to your community and your county is, what are we doing to help our mental health and what are we doing in our community to um, uh, you know house them and, and make sure that there's enough uh, you know counselors and in, in, in our community to, to talk with them and I can tell you right now just in my field there's not enough counselors to work with the teenagers so I, I really doubt there's enough um, mental health counselors in this community to, to work with your um, transient or mentally ill uh, transient population. Carrie? Uh, I really appreciate that you brought that up because it is definitely so interrelated and um, the coalition while the prevention and wellness initiative directly supports drug and alcohol abuse mental health is a huge part of that as well and one of the most concerning statistics for Monroe specifically is um, depression among youth and that was something that came out in the Healthy Youth Survey when one in six kids have seriously considered suicide, um, that's definitely something that we wanna address. And when substance abuse is something that they turn to in search of um, relief, um, definitely it's interrelated. We actually are starting, a, have a youth coalition that's gotten started and um, there's a group of kids that are especially passionate about mental health and um, the, one of them is here, raising her hand. Um, did you want to add something? Well, we'll need to get her a microphone if she. Um, anyway, so so I think that youth can make a huge difference, and uh, we're working on getting peer mentoring programs started at the high school, and and uh, and I think that having a group of youth that that see as their peers, what, what's happening, they will be able to make a big difference in that, so. Let's get the question that was next. Oh, you're over there, so we'll go ahead and get that gentleman there. You're behind you, just, just behind you, just behind you. Well, I was gonna ask you, uh, since the marijuana legalization, has there been an increase in like traffic problems, accidents, or just issues with drivers? Uh, and you know on on this question about drug abuse I used drugs when I was a teenager it wasn't because I was mental it was because I wanted to get high and I thought it was a good time we need to think about what we teach our kids what's fun and I mean you know it, it's sad to think that you got to do stuff like that to have fun I mean really Detective? Yeah, so, so I'll let Officer Corners talk about actually Monroe, but overall state, I don't think we have the stats yet from Washington Traffic Safety Commission to be able to say this is what we're seeing in DUI arrests that are resulting from marijuana. We haven't seen it yet. We're going to. Um, I know Colorado has seen an increase. They've seen a decrease in crime, which everybody's saying, eh, great, ever since we legalized marijuana, crime's going to, but they're also seeing an increase in DUI arrests and crashes we just have I don't know that I mean I don't have the stats yet um, but we will have that hi I'm uh, Ken Gennard I'm the deputy chief of Monroe PD I've been with Monroe for a couple of years I've been in law enforcement for 34 years and prior to coming to Monroe as district commander for the Washington State Patrol and in the statistic arena as far as drug to drivers over the last several years drug drivers are normally out during daytime hours and the numbers about 36 percent of, of all drivers on the road are drug drivers 
we kept stats on that for several years and it, it increased substantially before they legalized marijuana. I do not have the statistics afterwards, but I would suspect that it's going to skyrocket. And then how are you determining that? You can do a breathalyzer for uh, someone who is obviously drinking and driving. What's the procedure for marijuana? The procedure for marijuana is to bring in a drug recognition expert and uh, take and do specific tests for that. Uh, you can check the eyes, you can check so on and so forth. And with proper training, we can tell you whether it's a central nervous system stimulant or whether it's a depressant. We can't say exactly what drug it is. That has to be done by blood through the tox lab. But you can get a general idea through uh, through a drug recognition expert if the person is affected by a substance other than alcohol. Is we'll give physical tests out on the street. Our Monroe officers are trained in it. I know the county's trained in it. Uh, and after you give the specific physical tests, if they fail tests and there's no alcohol in the system, then we'll take them in for a drug evaluation. Thank you. Other questions? We have some, uh, some questions right there next to you. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to um, address the mental health thing again. I'm a student at Monroe High School, and um, that's my mom. Um, I was um, friends with one of my good friends committed suicide my freshman year, um, and we there was a couple of us who were friends with him, and we realized like how um, big of an issue suicide and depression really is, and so. I just wanted you to know that um, we just started meeting for the Youth Coalition this the end of the school year, um, and we are focusing more on the mental health area, and, but we're still focusing on the drug and alcohol, but more on the mental health for the youth at our school. So and then how would someone get in contact with your organization? Um, well, we haven't, like, figured out everything yet, but um, we are hoping to uh, maybe talk about it in an assembly and just, and have, we're gonna have advertising about these coalitions. It's kind of gonna be like a club at our school that anybody can join. And we're also gonna have a support group that people can come and talk um, if they need to. And um, we're also planning on going to the middle schools and maybe other schools and classes at the high school and sharing our story and um, spreading awareness about what an issue it really is. All right, well, thank you. Yeah. Well, we've got some other questions. Um, keep your hands up and we'll get a microphone over to you for your question here. Thank you all for your patience this evening <coughs> as well as we move here and there across um, the room. Yes, hi, This mm -hmm. I, I missed the meeting last week in Snohomish. I live in Snohomish, but I'm here today. Um, I just wanted to ask um, either the chief here or the um, detective. Uh, I wanted to ask why, what is, what do you think is the reason that it's in Snohomish and Monroe, it's become such an epidemic? I mean, I, I understand the supply end of it. I've, I'm 28 years clean and sober myself, but I understand the whole demand side of it. But what, what's the other reasons? that it has become such an epidemic. And, and let me just add to that, in, 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 uh, if it is unique to Monroe and Snohomish. I don't think so. I think the state of Washington is dealing with Monroe and what Snohomish is doing. You know, we're just, we're talking about it right now. That's what's a good thing. Um, it's, a, it's a business. It's, it's supply and demand. It's, uh, you know, if, if I, when the oxy prescription drug was at its high, people were paying 80 to 100 dollars a pill. And if they're using two or three pills a day, that's a very expensive habit. So as, as DEA, as law enforcement start to put the graps on, you know, enforcement for the pills and stuff, heroin came into the picture, and it was cheap, right? So if I'm a drug dealer. I'm going to flood the market with heroin, right? And you're going to get a whole bunch of people addicted to that drug, and then you're going to pull back 
production of it a little bit, and you're going to increase the price of that drug. So we've seen heroin go from, you know, a little piece costing twenty dollars to now it's costing sixty to seventy dollars for that same one. So whoever's selling that is making a ton of money. So, but, so. Again, we've got some roadway, the waterway, the railway, the airways. We've got a lot of ways in and out. What's that? I mean, and, and I'm just saying that from my perspective because I've been trying for three and a half years to get several people busted. And I've been reporting it to your agency, Snohomish. I've had long talks with the chief in Snohomish. Sure. And I just wonder, I mean, I, I see them get into jail and they get right back out. And they're right back in. And they're right back out. This has been going on for several years. I have sure. a personal stake in this, so this is personal for me. Um, but what I'm seeing is, is that like Snohomish just doesn't have enough cops who are assigned to drug enforcement, to do drug enforcement. I, um, and it doesn't seem like it's gotten any better in the last couple of years. I mean, this to me isn't the police fault. This to me is the city's fault. This is, you know, I mean, I'm all for building lots of parks in town. I think it's a good thing. But I think maybe if we really focused our money for the last next couple of years on really battling this monster, that maybe something could actually you know, maybe we could actually do something. But, you know, when you hear three years ago that they're saying, you know, yeah, well, we ran them out of town. They didn't run them out of town. Heroin was still going on in I, epidemic proportions. I, I think you know? that may be beyond the brief of this discussion, but I think it points but to, I think but I think it points to exactly what the solution is, which is for the people to get involved and to change things. Yeah, but we don't want to have a police state build more prisons and, and, and you know, build more police. So I think prevention, um, Carrie here, where, where she's working at in the youth, you know, working it from, from there up, I think is, is where it needs to happen. But, yeah, more prisons and more police, I don't think is the answer to we it. We have a couple more questions in the audience. We'll go back here and then we'll come right up front here. So the lady... Hi. So my question for you, Carrie. Um, first of all, I want to say that the heroin and meth go Could you hand identify hand. yourself? Pardon me? Could you identify yourself? Oh, sure. My name's Laura Bartley. I'm a citizen here in town. Um, the heroin and meth go hand in hand because they smoke the heroin. They sleep three or four days. They need the meth to wake up because I, I, my child lives it, so I understand it. Sorry. Um, for you, Carrie, um, can we get or is the coalition working on getting youth that are active users or currently recovering? at the middle school and high school level, not just kids that have seen it, but that have lived it and want to come in and talk about it to discourage the youth? I mean, if they looked at doing assemblies like that? Um, definitely, um, we're, as part of the, there are several boundaries and hoops, I guess you could say, because this is a state-funded project. And one of the requirements is that everything that we do be, not everything, but the majority of what we, the prevention programs that we have be um, proven best practices. And so anything, um, there have been some uh, research that has shown concern about having testimonials done. And I am not an expert on, um, we have, we have a part-time person that works for the county that supports our coalition and is has a lot of expertise in, in what not to do and what to do. And I actually, there's a handout, there's a sign-up sheet, and there's a lot of information that I left on the table out there that kind of shares. And I would love to talk with you about um, ways to get involved and how we can um, support. But um, I know that there are some concerns about um, drawing too much attention or attracting youth um, when they see other kids that even though it's a negative experience um, but that we are looking at every possible way um, that has been proven to help help our youth and um, so any prevention programs that are our best practices we are trying to implement as many of those as we can I have a question right down front here and uh, we're coming dangerously close to the end of our time here and we've had some terrific questions this afternoon <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to stand up. <laughs> Age and our privilege. Um, I've been working with the mentally ill for Could you identify at least, yourself, please? Uh, I work for uh, Seymour and Marysville. My name is Karen. Thank you. 
I'm a social worker there. I've been working with the mentally ill for at least 30 years. And the thing to understand, in my opinion, is the long-term addicts, the people that are really struggling with, you know, I gotta have this drug and, and they're seriously addicted, have serious mental health problems. You know, if the ones that are doing it for fun, they're doing it for fun. But the mental health system is broken. It's broken. It's broken all over the country. And unless we address that, we're not gonna be able to make a, a big enough dent. Thank you can you, see I'm very I, emotional about this. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. It's Thank real. You. And I think that's where we will, you know, try to bring this to is once we have meetings like this and we identify the problems, the causes, the roots, then as a people, we can go forward and try to change those things that need to be changed. I want to bring the session to a close by bringing it back to where we began and go to the base and ask when do you have the conversation with your child, with kids, about drug use? Is, is there a best time? Is there a, a, a good time, better time to have that conversation? I, oh. Go ahead. I would just say, I, would not, I wouldn't say the conversation. I, I would say it, it, it needs to be a, an open channel of communication that is established when they're in preschool, when they're very young, when they can start communicating. And that, that obviously we're not gonna start talking about the effects of meth to our three-year-old, but <laughs> um, it's, it's age appropriate. You know, what are, what are the good things that we put into our body? How do these things affect? Do you recognize what this is? And you know, this is, you know, just showing them pictures and identifying just really basic things. Um, we have a program that we're trying to get started called Halo, and it's directed toward preschool kids. And it just has uh, pictures, and you know, they can see a cookie or a, a glass of beer or a carrot stick, and just you know, picking out the things that might be good to put in their body and helping them at a, at a very basic level that's age appropriate. But I think establishing open lines of communication early and continuing to have those conversations and be aware of you know what's going on with their texting what's going on with their virtual world as they get older and just keeping tabs on who they hang out with and talking about all those things continually Bart? yeah um yeah just to piggyback on what carrie had said that i think it's very important to know understand i mean anybody that knows teenage development or been a teenager will understand that um, decision making isn't exactly their their strong suit you know, they, they haven't really figured you know, the, the risk to um, reward yet. So um, that's, like she said, I, uh, as a, as a uh, parent of a teenager, I, I monitor, and especially when, the, especially at those uh, ages when they're very, um, you know, influenced, uh, I monitored everything that was going on. You know, what friends uh, my daughter had, um, who she, you know, what she, like she said, texting, computers, what she was looking at on the TV, those type of things, and then had conversations about those things. You know, hey, what, what, how is she perceiving those things, and how, what she thinks about those things. And, you know, friends that come up to her at school, or she's, you know, starts noticing people using drugs at her school, or the conversations with teenagers, you know, start to happen, like she said, about sixth grade, seventh grade, you know, and that'd be, just like ongoing conversation with my in my household and and you, your response to your daughter when she says what's the matter dad don't you trust me <laughs> no <laughs> <clears throat> i know i know too much about adolescent brain science <laughs> no detective <laughs> yeah i i mean the schools that i go and talk to and and stuff we in arlington and stanwood we we've uh targeted the sixth grade type class so sixth seventh grade is when we start talking showing pictures and it's not that we show pictures to say hey this is how you use it it's hey if you're at a friend's house and they say huff this in <clears throat> makes you feel good you know that that's huffing and or inhaling and that's dangerous or if they say hey, take this little pill you know how do you know what's in that little pill we don't know they could say it's Tylenol or they could say it's this that makes you stay up longer we don't know so I mean I, I think for me as law enforcement I think teaching and talking in school starting at the sixth grade level is a, is a great place to start. Officer? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, values in your home. Um, you know, your job as a parent, and uh, I 
we talk about this when I when we talk about gangs or anything else is your your job is to raise a good little human being and to send them on their way. Um, and I know it's difficult now, and again, with society the way it is today, there's a lot of single family homes. I've talked to people in, in gang relations, the same type of thing, where, where a single mother has five jobs and they don't have time to know what their child is doing. Again, they're your child. Know what they're doing. Uh, look at their Facebook page. Look who they're writing things to. If you give them a cell phone, it's your cell phone. They're just borrowing it. Look through their cell phone. Uh, you know, there's some privacy things, but they're your child. And their welfare is what you're looking at. Uh, know who their friends are. Um, and I know, again, it's difficult because sometimes we're all working so much, or both parents are working, or there's only one parent in the household. But I think try to stress knowing what your child is doing and trying to be as involved as you can. And, and what are the signs that a parent should be looking for? What are the indicators that maybe their child is involved with drugs? Um, change in behavior. I mean, you, you know your kid's behavior. Changing the eating patterns, changing the friends, changing the way they're talking, changing the way they're, um, you know, sleeping, just changing behaviors. If, the, if there's, you know, their schoolwork, those are the, the big indicators. Um, that I find that are the most um, indicative of kids that start using drugs. Yeah, what do they smell like when they come home? You know, my wife hugs my kid when he comes home. She wants to know what he smells like. <laughs> you know, I mean, are you at a friend? Say, oh yeah, I'm at Johnny's house and their parents smoke. Well, Johnny's parents don't smoke and you've got, you know, nicotine on your, your clothing, you know, or I smell a little bit of alcohol or something. So, you know, and to, you know, I'm kind of, we get, we start getting police thinking and stuff. I'm a little hardcore with that, but it's, it's our cell phone that we're giving our kids to use. If you don't know the password, then take the cell phone. If they want the, pa if they want the cell phone, you know, the Facebook and all that stuff, you need to know the password so you can monitor what they're doing, you know, so. You'll learn a lot about your child by reading their Facebook. <laughs> and uh, Carrie, anything you'd like to add? Um, I just, I guess want to add that um, a lot of things that we don't think of directly as drug and alcohol prevention or um, uh, just talking to our kids about anything, keeping open lines of communication, Bart mentioned being involved um, in activities and sports um, when they're younger, um, family dinner, I, but I think with all of these things, um, it's not a foolproof. There is nothing foolproof, and kids have pressures and things to deal with at school, and so many environmental factors that we can't control. And we do our best to prepare them and and to know where they are and what they're doing. Um, but we we can't control, and and so having um, I I guess I in our community having as much of addressing the root causes and trying to in a widespread way provide support for filling in the gaps and, and the before we do. uh go down the panel and let each of you make some f concluding remarks here just what's the single or is there a single motivating pressure that leads a kid into drugs is it boredom is it a psychological genetic flaw mm. What takes them to drugs in the first place? Well, as what you said, boredom. I mean, there's many different reasons why people choose to do things. Sometimes they want to hang out with the cool guys or the cool girls you know, who are making poor decisions, uh, self-esteem issues. Um, but yeah, if you look at, and while I was at the school and I have four children of my own, three or two are adults now, and, and thank goodness I was fortunate enough they didn't get involved in any narcotics or alcohol. I was a 16-year-old who's the same thing, so I'm crossing my fingers to get the last one out the door. But the kids that you see that are busy doing things, whether it's youth groups or sports, generally have a good path. You know, the old saying, idle hands are the devil's playground. I mean, they made, they, that saying is for a reason. Uh, I think that, yeah, that sometimes if you have, they have too much time on their hands, 
well, sometimes you're going to make poor decisions. Bart, what, what have you found <laughs> takes kids into drugs? Um, yeah, it's a socioeconomic thing, so it, addiction. So, yeah, it's a lot, there's a lot of factors. I think there's, um, you know, peer pressure. I find a lot of kids um, that I've talked to, I'll ask them, uh, a lot of kids that I've worked with, I'll ask them what's the first initial drug use they've, they've done, and a lot of kids will say it's, you know, a friend that they'll um, have seen or an older sibling um, that has, you know, steered them into that direction. But, you know, anything, you know, we talked a little bit about the emotional um, triggers that kids will have, you know, that they'll find, you know, if you look at the media today, you know, if I watch some of those, everybody seen Pineapple Express, it looks fun. You know, that stuff looks fun to them. So, um, you, you, like you said, having that conversation, you know, that's, that's what you got to talk to the kid. It's not exactly, that's, they're, they're, they're showing one side of it on, on the media. You know, so you really got to have that conversation with your, your child, I think. We've come to that point in the evening where it's just about the end of our forum. I want to thank all of you for coming out. And I, and I would like to also give the opportunity for each of the panelists to just wrap their thoughts up and bring this evening to a conclusion. And since we began with uh, Officer Cornish, we'll begin with Carrie. Thank just you. some final thoughts for tonight. I just want to uh, express my appreciation for all of you being here. I think it's uh, it's great to see so many people that are concerned about this issue in our community, and I just want to invite anyone who has um, a, an interest to be involved more. To um, I have there's a sign up sheet in the hall in the hallway for the Monroe Community Coalition, and it's just a way to um, get involved in. Um, like I mentioned, there are people from all different perspectives in our community, and um, we are never going to have enough police officers or enough. Um, it's, it's something that we need to address as a community and all work together. So I appreciate everyone being here and, and showing concern. Thank you, Bart. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I'd like to echo that. Thank you for coming out, and thank you, Snow Owl, for um, giving us the opportunity to um, speak. Um, and uh, just we Catholic Community Services has a counselor out at Sultan. I know that um, does IOP groups or um, outpatient groups for drug and, drug addiction. And I'm not sure. I don't think Monroe has too much. And I think Seymour is here in town, and they don't have much as far as uh, outpatient uh, um, or or any kind of actually our state kind of lacks in in um, youth. Uh, addiction facilities so you know that's something that kind of hard but um there's a card out there for the our counselor catholic community services counselor at sultan if somebody's interested in that or have a, a youth that has a problem with drugs and um uh, also cocoon house um works with at-risk youth and i have a lot of information on the desk out there and so if you have an at-risk youth that's living on the streets or, or you know of one, um, that's also a good resource. Thank you. Detective? Yeah, I appreciate you guys all coming tonight. I hope you learned something. Um, a couple things, you know, I, I, put, I brought some pamphlets, brochures and stuff. You never know what people, what you guys want to take home with you. My business card's out there. Although I'm not assigned to Monroe, I'm here in Snohomish County, so I, I'm here for you if you need something, if you want training with something. You know, I'm not here to step on Monroe, uh, the city. I'm here to work with them and work with their department. Um, but So use me as a resource if you need to. If there's something you need, my email's address is on there, and I'll mail it to you, come and drop it off to you, but you can use me as a resource. Um, one, I think it's really cool that you got four cops here from Monroe. They got command staff here and stuff. They're they're concerned. It's not an epidemic, crazy, out of control thing that's happening in Monroe. Um, it's just happening all around Snohomish County, all around Washington. What you guys are seeing that's out there. So you know, it's 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 a downer subject, heroin and, and meth and stuff. But it's something that we have to address and stuff. So it's cool to see people from <coughs> Monroe here and being involved. Um, again, you guys can all use yourself as resources. I mean, you can connect on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram. You can get emails from each other. You guys can spread the word now that you you know were involved in something like this. And if somebody says, hey. 
you know, I missed out. It was really great. Well, come back to Snow Island, see if they can do it again somewhere else, maybe in Sultan or maybe hold another one here in Monroe or go someplace else again. So, you know, use you guys, you know, communicate with each other because that's how we're going to reach out to the community and take back the community and stuff. So, I mean, I think, I think it's great that you guys are here and I appreciate, you know, all the panelists here. So thank you. Officer Carnage. And thank you. I know it sounds weird. It's the fourth person to say that, but thank you for coming. It's, it's impressive, you know, obviously you care about your families, your community, and the situation. Um, and, and again, my thing is, you know, youth is a big thing. Start when they're young um, with your children, grandchildren, nephews, nieces. Uh, we, we all have a vested interest in the youth of society. And I know they told me this when I was 13 years. You will be, you know, you will be running the country when you're, when you're my age. Um, so, you know, involvement I think is really important. And again, uh, for people in Monroe, if you see something that makes you go, huh, call. Somebody's riding at 3 in the morning down your street on a bicycle when he's 35 years old, call. We love those calls. Um, and again, it's just uh, trying to nip it in the mud. I'll make it five. Thank you for coming out tonight. Thank you for sitting at the table and being part of the panel this evening. Detective David Chitwood of the Snohomish Regional Drug and Gang Task Force, Bart Wheaton, Chemical Dependency Counselor, Catholic Community Services and Cocoon House, Carrie Boone, Vice Chair of the Monroe Community Coalition, and Officer Scott Cornish of the Monroe Police Department. We've come to the end of our allotted time. Don't forget that there is an evaluation form that we'd like to have you fill out with any thoughts or suggestions how to uh, improve it for future shows, what other future topics might be discussed in these Issues That Matter forums. Civil discourse on the issues that matter is what makes solutions possible. And we want to thank the panel. We want to thank you for coming and sharing your time and uh, your thoughts and ideas tonight on the issue of drug use along Highway 2. And I want to thank you for uh, this opportunity to, to, to be here tonight and, and talk with you and learn as well. And thanks as well to the Snow Isle Libraries, the Snow Isle Libraries Foundation, for making it possible for us to be here tonight. And if tonight's discussion has made you more curious, there's lots of information that's available right through that door. And I want to thank you again for coming out. Thank you all. <laughs>